Hey everybody, welcome to this video on topic 195 in the countdown of the 200 highest yield topics for USMLE step one. start by just talking a little bit about acetylcholine receptors. So there's two major types of acetylcholine receptors. You have your nicotinic and muscarinic receptors. So the nicotinic receptor is a receptor that is known to be ionotropic. In other words, it's a receptor that is directly linked to ion channels. So it's, this is a very important receptor in the autonomic nervous system we'll talk about in a minute. It's directly linked to the distribution of this calcium and sodium ions across the cell membrane. Now the muscarinic receptor is a little bit different. It's a GPCR, G protein coupled receptor, there's going to be a secondary messenger system that indirectly links ion channels to the muscarinic receptor. Let's just look at the somatic and autonomic nervous system and how they use these neurotransmitters and receptors. We have our spinal cord and we have some uh, voluntary motor nerve. So just one single nerve, right? Just one going from the uh, spinal cord to some skeletal muscle. And so its synapses at a nicotinic receptor, which is the ionotropic receptor directly linked to ion channels. It's going to use acetylcholine as its neurotransmitter at this nicotinic receptor. Receptor. So this is an NM nicotinic receptor. Under the category of nicotinic receptors, there's NM receptors and NN receptors. So the NM receptor, like you see here, think of M as like muscle. So NM receptors are the ones that are on skeletal muscle. The NN receptors are the ones that are in the autonomic nervous system. So now we're looking at the parasympathetic nervous system. Again, we have a neuron. In this case, it's going to synapse with another neuron before it gets to its target. So these have two neurons. So we have a pre ganglionic and a postganglionic neuron before we reach our target. Now, in general, all preganglionic fibers of the autonomic nervous system are cholinergic. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I mean that they all use acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. I'll say that again because it's very important. All preganglionic fibers, whether it be parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system, all use acetylcholine as their transmitter in the preganglionic fibers. They all use acetylcholine. And so this one, you see the acetylcholine, it's synapsing at an NN, right? Because we're in the autonomic nervous system, nicotinic receptor. And then that receptor will go on to bind to a muscarinic receptor, in which again, it will use acetylcholine, but this would be a GPCR receptor. So it's a little bit different. Remember the parasympathetic division is the like the cranial sacral outflow division. So in other words, you have cell bodies located in cranial nerves, cranial nerve three, ciliary ganglion, seven uh, submandibular, along with the pterygopalatine ganglion, and then nine is the otic ganglion. And then you have your vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, and then S2 through S4 also will be giving you uh, parasympathetic innervation. Parasympathetic fibers are very long. So we're gonna compare the parasympathetic fiber length to the sympathetic fiber length. So you can see the sympathetic nervous system has very short preganglionic fibers, and then the postganglionic fibers fibers are quite a bit longer than we saw in the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so we have to see that here. And again, all the preganglionics are going to synapse with the nicotinic NN receptors using acetylcholine. Okay, and then you can see, we're not going to get into all the detail in, that's into these uh, postganglionic innervation. We'll talk about that in a future video, but you can see we have all different kinds. At, at sweat glands, we have our muscarinic receptors, which is probably the most relevant to this discussion. And then you see norepinephrine, dopamine. And remember that the sympathetic division is the thoracolumbar outflow division. So this can consists of cell bodies in the lateral horn of the spinal cord in the intermedial lateral cell columns. And these usually go from T1 to L2. So with muscarinic antagonist, there is a mnemonic for the anticholinergic toxidrome. I wrote it down here, hot as a hair, dry as a bone, red as a bee, blind as a bat, mad as a hatter. The bowel and bladder lose their tone and the heart runs alone. So basically what we're saying here is that when you use a muscarinic antagonist, you're gonna shut down cholinergic activity. So again, you can have dilation of the pupil, right? Madriasis, cycloplegia. This is where you have paralysis of the ciliary muscles. Remember the ciliary ganglion, right? Cranial nerve three is part of your parasympathetic division. And uh, that will result in loss of accommodations. You also have dry eyes. You have a decrease in your hydrogen ATPase, right? Because the vagus nerve can directly stimulate the parietal cells. You have decrease in gut motility, constipation. They all go kind of hand in hand. And then the urinary retention, which we'll talk about in a moment, tachycardia, anhydrosis, so you can't sweat and dry mouth. So a lot of this just has to do with the inability to form secretions. That's another easy way that you can try and remember it. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about specific specific drugs that are used as muscarinic antagonists. So let's start with atropine, which is probably the most high yield. It can be used in the eye, right? We already said that it's a muscarinic antagonist, so it's gonna cause 
dilation like you see here. You can get pupillary dilation, you can get cycloplasia, and sometimes this is used in ophthalmologic exams so you can see structures in the eye that you normally wouldn't be able to see if it wasn't dilated. Atropine is also going to have effects on M1 and M2 receptors, particularly the M2 receptors which are at the heart. So remember, cholinergic activity would cause bradycardia. So now we're talking about a muscarinic antagonist, so a, an inhibitor of that activity. So typically, if somebody has bradycardia, maybe they just had an MI and their heart's not beating fast enough. This person has a significant bradycardia. You can give them atropine. You can also use atropine for bradycardia. So remember, cholinergic activity would cause a slower heart rate. Anticholinergic activity would cause tachycardia. And so because atropine is an inhibitor of cholinergic activity, it can be used to treat bradycardia, but it can also cause tachycardia. And it does this by binding to muscarinic M2 receptors at the heart and essentially is going to block the effects of the vagus nerve at the sinoatrial node. It also is known to kind of have some effects at the AV node where it can actually increase conduction and shorten your PR interval, but that's beyond the scope of this video. Finally, atropine is used as an antidote, and this is probably the most high yield use for step one. So it's used as an antidote in conjunction with another drug known as pralidoxine. So first let's talk about what exactly is the toxidrome that it's used for. So this is from usually organophosphate poisoning. And so organophosphates irreversibly inhibit acetylcholinesterase. So remember, you have acetylcholine in your synaptic cleft and acetylcholinesterase is going to break it down. And so some of it can get reabsorbed and some of it leaves the synaptic cleft. In this case, you're inhibiting, irreversibly inhibiting the thing that breaks acetylcholine down. So now you have a ton of acetylcholine, you're overstimulating your muscarinic or nicotinic receptors, whatever's at that site. And so this is going to present with your dumbbells mnemonic. So diarrhea, urination, pupillary constriction, bronchospasm, bradycardia, excitation, lacrimation, sweating, salivation. So in this case, you have someone who has an excess secretion. So it's kind of, it's it's the it's a cholinergic toxidrome. So this is commonly occurs with insecticides, malathion, parathion, uh, nerve gases can do this. Farmers are a classic patient in a board question or someone who's in uh, an industrial worker um, who can potentially be exposed to these chemicals are the people that you want to look for in a question stem. And obviously put that together with the presentation if they have dumbbells, for example. So in terms of treatment, the one thing that I really want you to remember that comes up a lot is what is the first step if somebody comes in and they have this organophosphate poisoning? The first step is to remove their clothes and wash the patient. And the reason for that is because organophosphates can be absorbed through the skin. So you want to get all their clothes off, clean the patient, and as soon as you do that, then you can begin your treatment with the atropine and the pralidoxime. So those are the two drugs, atropine and pralidoxime. The atropine is going to help block the effects of acetylcholine, and then the pralidoxime is going to reactivate the acetylcholinesterase. So they're, it's kind of like a two-pronged synergistic approach. Somebody has seizures, right, or they have fasciculations. In those cases, you also want to treat medically with benzodiazepines. So now we'll talk about benztropine and trihexyphenidyl. So these two drugs are used in Parkinson's disease. So remember that in basal ganglia, you have a balance between dopamine and acetylcholine. And you can see in this image here, dopamine is exerting some inhibitory effect on acetylcholine acetylcholine to keep it in balance. But if we start to lose our dopaminergic neurons or when we decrease dopamine, now you have an increase in acetylcholine sensitivity. And so without dopamine, there might be too much acetylcholine and that excess acetylcholine can then have effects at other neurotransmitters like GABA. And then that can exacerbate the effects that you see in Parkinson's disease. Therefore, anticholinergic medications will improve Parkinson's disease symptoms. And these are the two that you want to remember. Also remember scopolamine is used for motion sickness. It is a really fast onset. Typically it's just a patch that you can put on. It works well for that. So scopolamine, motion sickness. Hypertropium and teotropium are both used in asthma and COPD. So remember on the cholinergic side, right, that can cause acetylcholine can cause bronchoconstriction where you really don't want that if you have someone with an asthma or COPD exacerbation, you want the airways dilated. And so in those cases, you can use muscarinic antagonists to inhibit the acetylcholine and allow for bronchodilation. Oxybutynin and glycoprolate are used in urge incontinence. And this question tends to come up a lot. First of all, what is urge incontinence? Urge incontinence is when you have a sudden urge to urinate. So sudden and so powerful that a lot of times you can't actually make it to the bathroom in time to urinate. And so there's some urinary incontinence. Frequent urinary leakage at night is pretty classic for this and it's due to the detrusor muscle being overstimulated. So that's a cholinergic problem. And so to fix that, you can use anticholinergic medications. These two are particularly high yield to remember. And the way that you diagnose urge incontinence 
for patients if it comes up in a board question is you use urodynamic testing so you can see the detrusor activity. Typically, these medications can be used in real life as well for patients that have mild UTI infections and they have this urge to constantly urinate. You can use them for that as well and for bladder spasms that patients have after they've had urologic surgery. Okay, so to recap the big three, again, you should know the effects of muscarinic antagonists. So know your toxidromes, your cholinergic and your anticholinergic. Here we have the anticholinergic toxidrome. Then also remember atropine praladoxine for organophosphate toxicity. Make sure you take the clothes off and wash the patient so it doesn't get absorbed through the skin. Oxybutynin and glycoprolate are used in urgent continence primarily, but have a couple other uses by exerting anticholinergic activity at the detrusor muscle. And there are no significant images for this PowerPoint, but it is a good idea to remember your pre and post ganglionic neurons and their innervations. Thank you guys for watching this video.